This week I enjoyed an encyclopedic deep dive into our Western Australian native bush food with specialist Dale Tilbrook. Dale is the owner of the Marlin Up Gallery in the Swan Valley and is also one of the ambassadors for the Entwined in the Valley Food, Wine and Music Festival this, later this week. Dale provides insights into the traditional Aboriginal food and eating habits, how and where Aboriginal people migrated during the year for their food, as well as insights into their traditional farming methods. She also provides guidance for typical food that we can easily look for, as well as where to go to learn more within this very wide topic area. There is further discussion about how bush food can be not just added to our traditional Western recipes, but also how we can start to reshape our recipes as well, in line with some of the more native bush food that's available to us. Dale also gives us a commentary on the current state of the bush food industry. It becomes really clear from early on in this conversation that the state of Western Australia has more to offer to our diet than we realise and tap into. So, enjoy Dale. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. How can we incorporate bush food into our everyday cooking? That's what we're going to explore today with my guest, Dale Tilbrook. A wild dandy bibbleman woman from Margaret River, Bustleton area, Dale had a career in retail and marketing before she located to the Swan Valley in 1998 and opened up the Marlin Up Gallery with her brother Lyle, offering authentic Aboriginal arts, gifts and souvenirs. Having spent many years gathering knowledge from her elders and other sources, Dale is often called on to talk about bush food, which she loves presenting and encouraging people to incorporate into their everyday cooking. Dale is also one of the ambassadors of the Entwined in the Valley Food, Wine, Music and Art Festival later this week in the Swan Valley, where she'll be sharing much of her bush food wisdom. Dale, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Bryn. So one of the questions um, I'd like to delve into with all of my guests right at the start, um, because it's called WA Real, is their relationship with Western Australia. So you can, can you tell me a bit about what it was like growing up in the Bustleton area? Okay, well, I was actually born in Port Hedland, oh. or if, even though my traditional country is Bustleton, Margaret River, Augusta, Pemberton, Nanup, my dad was working in the north, right. so three of us were born in the north. Um, I was born in Port Hedland, I have another brother born in Broome, and one born in Derby. Right, so, nicely spread out. Nicely spread out, yes, and the first one was born in Perth. So my mother always used to say, you know, there was one baby every time they moved further up the coast. And once we got to Derby and had another baby, she said, we're not going to live in Wyndham. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we had wonderful childhood. Um, I particularly remember Derby because, you know, I was there from age about six to 12. And, you know, that, that's quite a big time of your mm. childhood. And we had a fabulous childhood there. You know, it was so free. Nobody ever locked their doors. You left your keys in the car. You know, we went to school at 7.30 in the morning and we finished at lunchtime because it was mm. too hot after that. Yeah. We'd go home for lunch and then as long as we were home by dark, nobody knew where we were. Right. But we'd be in a little group and just playing wherever, visiting friends, they'd be visiting us, we'd be going out in the bush, we'd be going out on the marsh, even though we we're not supposed to go on the marsh. And, you know, we always thought that nobody was looking out for us or looking after us, but of course they were. Um, the reserve used to be on the marsh in those days, and we used to live opposite the reserve in Derby. So, of course, all those old people always keeping an eye on what we mm. were doing. We thought we were being independent. So, were there any days when they sort of came to your help and rescue and you realised that they were keeping your life? Well, sometimes they would just redirect us. And, you know, because, you know, the, on those marshes, there's, you know, when the, there's crocodiles and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes they just point us in a different direction and say, don't go that way, go that way. Yes. And, yeah, you know, we'd just be happily playing away and having our games and adventures and I remember one time my brother was playing underneath my dad's office, which was on the corner from where we lived, and it was up on stilts. And there was a lot of stuff underneath that office. And a few of he and a few of his friends were running around and playing. And he kept running past this crocodile with its mouth open. And he thought it was a stuffed one. Because in those days, everybody had a little stuffed crocodile. Yeah. 
until one time he was running past it moved Ooh. and he thought hmm that one's not stuffed so he we went and got dad and dad was um, showing him and his friends how to pick this crocodile up so he picked him up behind his ears sort of thing and and put him down again and he did this a few times but the crocodile was very smart and about the third time he did it the crocodile got him oh. snapped his hand <laughs> good lord he had to go to the hospital and have it attended to because crocodile bites can be very nasty even if it's only a little crocodile because they have all the bacteria in there yeah <laughs> so where did you, where did you live after 12 um then we went to the south my dad was posted to narogen and, uh, you know, what a culture shock that was, going from Derby to Narogen and having our first real winter. I was going to say, temperature shock. It that, was thought. cold. It was so cold, I couldn't believe it. And it was also a culture shock in terms of really coming across that redneck racism for the first time. Right. You know, because in the north, you know, there, there were differences, but really nobody cared where we came from or who we were we just fitted in mm -hmm. and you know it was really obvious and apparent going to Narogen that there was a big divide before between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and most people didn't know where to put us they they were suspicious mm. we never talked talked to them about who we were but people did know because they they knew the family um, and you know, we were sort of a bit isolated. A bit, I found it a very lonely place. Yeah. And eventually I left and, and went to live with my English grandmother in Perth and went to school up, up here. And I was much happier in an all-girls school mm. in the suburbs. Yes. So from that all-girls school, um, graduated, went to university, got married... That all fell apart, needed to do something else, went overseas for a year and stayed away for 10 years. As and people do. As people do. And then after my daughter was born in London, I thought London is not the place to raise children. So back home I came with my daughter yeah. and been here ever since. Still love travelling and I'm off to Italy soon yes. uh, to the Slow Food Festival and be presenting bush foods there as well mm. but yeah love wa probably wouldn't ever want to live anywhere else love exploring wa you know as a child i had many opportunities to go to places that people are only just finding out about now such as you know all the all the gorges and all the hidden places in the kimberley and yeah. you know we'd go out with mum and dad you know we'd even when we were living in Derby, we'd go to Broome for weekends and the roads weren't sealed then. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was a long drive. Yeah, it was a long, and dust, yeah. dust on those unsealed roads. Oh, yeah. And we'd camp in an old cottage up in the sand hills and there was no cable beach resort then. There were no coconut palms because they don't belong there. And we'd have bonfires on the beach. Hmm. Don't suppose you're allowed to have bonfires on the beach anymore. And we'd just, we'd just be us and maybe another family and we'd just have a ball mm. on the beach and then we'd drive back to Derby because in Derby you don't swim in the sea because if the sharks don't get you, the crocodiles will. And if they don't get you, maybe a sea snake. Yeah, <laughs> probably about to get you. Yeah. So um, where did you amass your knowledge of bush food from? Oh, look, I've always been interested in plants and what they can do, mm. you know, whether it's medicine or for skin care or for food. Mm. So, and when did this start? As a, as oh, a, as this started a as a kid. Mm. Um, and my mother was English, my father was Aboriginal, so my mother, wherever we went, used to scratch out a veggie garden and utilise whatever was around, available mm. locally in the bush. Yes. So... Even though she was English, she was always interested in local food mm -hmm. and making sure that, you know, we would get fresh vegetables and fruits and things. So she'd incorporate whatever she could and started my interest. And of course, my English grandmother was a great cook. So I learned lots of cooking skills from her. I can mm -hmm. remember going somewhere with my dad once and 
somebody served kangaroo tail brawn, but they brought it in a big square kerosene tin. Right. And just sort of wobbled it out on the table and then everybody was just taking great big chunks of this brawn, this great big tower, wobbling tower of kangaroo tail brawn. I still make kangaroo tail brawn to today. <laughs> I don't make it in a big kerosene tin though. Yeah. Lots of things were cooked in kerosene tins in the old days, so those, yeah. those square silver ones that nobody ever sees anymore. How did your mum go from, uh, you know, obviously applying her knowledge of growing vegetables to that, to, to, to in Australia, in Western well, Australia, and when, learning about the native... When, when my mum and dad married, um, they didn't have a house. They lived on the back of a truck, and my dad's job took him all through the bush. What was your dad's job? He was working for um, Native Welfare in those days. Um, I think he was the first Noongar man to work for Native Welfare. And um, he'd be on patrol. He'd be going from community to community. And they would set up camp in the bush. My mother learnt to dig soaks to get water, you know, cook on an open fire. My oldest brother lived on the back of that truck with them and she got her first house in Port Hedland when she was eight months pregnant with me. Right. So, yeah, she, she got her first-hand knowledge from people in the bush. There we go. Quite very outdoor. Yes, her mother used to write to her as Dear Daisy Bates. <laughs> what, why, what does that mean? Oh, the reference to Daisy Bates. Daisy yes. Bates was an amateur um, anthropologist and writer and she spent a lot of time um, with Aboriginal people, particularly yeah. in Noongar country, also in the north a bit, and ended up in South Australia. But she's buried in Wajan. She was a an interesting figure. She's been um, responsible for recording a lot of Noongar language and Noongar stories and we have to be very grateful to people like her yes. for writing it down for us yes. and she recorded a lot of genealogies as well but you know she used to make her living out of writing sensational pieces right. for newspapers and magazines and when you read some of the stuff that she wrote in those days you know it, it just makes your skin crawl and make you just like oh but you know, that was her way of making a living and, mm. you know, that's what's obviously sold her stories. So we regard her with, you know, sort of mixed feelings, grateful for some of what she yes. recorded, but the rest of it you can keep. Right, right. I'm curious to know because I've had, um, I've had a number of people on the podcast talking about um, food and food preparation, et cetera, et cetera, and, and most people um, come from sort of a, a Western background. Hmm. So I'm curious to know what would traditionally be the food that Aboriginal people would eat and um, also how did they eat? I mean, we have this very regimented breakfast, lunch, dinner. Okay. And, it, and it, it's quite a behavioural pattern. So well, I'm curious to know other ways. We okay. ate different things in different areas, obviously. Yeah. We ate what was there. Yes. And if I talk about the Southwestern Noongar food, because that's what I focus on mainly now. Yes. Um, although I do incorporate ingredients from all over Australia, and we'll get to that. But here in the Southwest, our, tr our staple food was roots and tubers. Mm -hmm. And most people would not realise that all along Durbal Yerrigan, and the Swan River, before European settlement, in that lovely alluvial river soil, were huge yam gardens. Right. If you looked at early settler maps from 1829, you'd see these yam gardens marked as warren holes, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that they're talking about rabbit warrens, mm. but there weren't any rabbits here then. No. Rabbits came much later. So warren is our word for the yam, Dioscora hastifolia, and this is a long, thin yam. It's about up to 30 centimetres long and it's about as thick as your thumb but they're not all that big yeah. so some of them are much smaller and um, Europeans recorded that at Walyunga during Jiren the season of autumn then up to 600 people would gather for ceremony and the staple food they ate were the yams right so you can imagine how big those yam gardens were yeah, yeah. 
so there's another yam or bush potato more sometimes called a radish that's has the potential to become very popular from the southwest which is the yulk mm -hmm. it's a platter sack platter sack deflexa and it's sometimes called the raven's thought radish it's right. crunchy like a radish but it's part of the carrot family if you smell it it smells carroty you taste it it's some people say nashi pear some people say carrot so you get the impression that it tastes pretty good yes. and it does and it's a strange vegetable in that it stays crisp and crunchy even when you cook it right so you can put it in your soup cut it up into little cubes and put it in your soup and have a bit of crunch in there and things like mm. that or put it through salads i mean it's just crisp and crunchy and delicious and um you know there's a group called noongar land enterprises and one of the crops that they're experimenting with is this yolk right so maybe in a few years you'll see it in supermarkets or at least in gourmet shops in gourmet fruit, shops yeah gourmet fruit and veg shops maybe a little bit longer before we see it in coles or Wolf. although you know horticultural innovation australia did an investigation on native vegetables and came to the conclusion that yolk had the potential to take about 10% of the potato market. Right. So it has potential. We would rather that it was grown here in the southwest. We don't want people growing it in other parts of Australia because, you know, it's our food. Yeah. And we want to be very selfish and keep it here. <laughs> That's pretty transparent. <laughs> well, you know, all our knowledge, all our IP, all our food, everything gets exploited as soon as... Yes non-Aboriginal people find out about it. They say, that's great. We just want to take that away from you now. Commercialise it. Commercialise it and, and grow it somewhere else and not benefit share with you. Mm. So we'd like to keep it here and benefit yes, share with ourselves. Benefit share with yourself, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. But um, I suppose the other part of my question was, you, know, you, you, t you talked about the ceremony of, of like 600 odd people yeah. coming together to eat the yams. How, I mean... Would traditionally people sort of eat when they're hungry or eat when there is abundance or well you know you were eating when you were hungry you ate mm. to satisfy hunger mm. and you know there are no words for please and thank you in our language because we shared resources and we shared resources according to need and availability yeah. no, no free lunches though everybody was supposed to do their bit yeah everybody made their contribution according to their ability and everybody got looked after therefore yeah so women would work together collectively gathering the merin the vegetable food and men would work together collectively to gather the darch the meat food right about 80 percent of the food that we ate was merin hmm. or food collected by the women like so you know it was an incredibly healthy diet because we collected and ate on the same day and we were very spoiled here in the southwest because mm. this was an extremely lush part of the world yes. and it had been expertly managed for 60,000 plus years yes. and we moved across the land according to those six seasons and we would access and share big food resources in those areas at that time yes so we were never depleting the resources in one mm. area. Mm. We moved in that cycle that allowed things to grow and recover. Mm. And the yam gardens, for example, we would access during Cherin, autumn, and during Cumberung, late spring. And the rest of the time, we left Mother Nature to look after our gardens for us. And that was facilitated by the fact that the women, when they dug the yams, didn't fill in the holes because the next time you came to dig, it was easier to dig in from the side mm. to access the tubers. And by leaving the holes open and allowing the leaf litter in and the water in, you were gathering the nutrients for the garden. Right. And the yams will naturally spread as you disturb the soil. And the good thing about that uneven ground also is that the native animals like kangaroos don't like uneven ground because it's easy for them to break a leg yes so they stay away as well and that's one so of the reasons why the europeans them. didn't like the yam gardens because they couldn't ride their horses through them right 
but of course they also wanted our good alluvial soil right next to the river and everybody wanted a piece of the river because mm. that was the big transport artery mm. and so bye bye yam gardens bye bye food source bye bye aboriginal people mm. where would people go in the other seasons okay so generally <coughs> By the time we got to Birak, which is first summer, that's basically December, January, people would be at coastal locations for a very good reason. One, the weather's fabulous. Everybody wants to go to the beach at Christmas time. <laughs> to go to the beach. <laughs> and that's when the fish and prawns and crabs are running yes. along the coast. Yes. So huge food sources, which meant lots of people could be there and supported. Yes. Yeah. And then after that Bunuru hot season... We're still in the estuaries and river mouths and along the rivers mm -hmm. and we're slowly making our way back to our inland camps because you want to be a little bit away or a long way away depending on where your original place is from the coast during Makaru winter time because that's where the storms come from and you want to be inland and accessing all those big waterways that used to exist all over. Mm the Perth area for example and that's one of the things I was talking about to some other people this morning that there was a chain of wetlands, swamps, waterways inlets, rivulets, brooks uh, all through the area that we now call Perth which over time have been the creeks have been buried, the swamps have been drained and waterways have become fewer and much deeper. I mean, the water still has to be there somewhere. It's still got to go somewhere. Yeah. But it's now so it's in... Come together and gone deep. It's deeper lakes and things like that. Mm. So, yeah. the Those areas that were abundant with food for us during those winter months, all that, um, you know, the frogs and the freshwater crustaceans and the water birds and the freshwater turtles and things that was our food and that was our hunting ground and that disappeared too mm. 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 so we would be moving in different places and getting different food at different times of the year along the Woolyerrigan were great big kangaroo grass fields too so we would harvest that and then burn it oh. off to re regenerate yeah you know we would burn the bulrushes the yanjit during hot season bunaroo and then harvest them during jerin mm. and process the roots and make um, little bread cakes out of them and today i was hearing them being referred to as invasive weeds and i said not weeds food if you're going to pull them out pull them out and process them make flour yeah. out of them yeah. yeah. So I think I set some minds alight today. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. So yeah, so there's a lovely picture there of people moving from inland to coast in and line back. with the weather, yeah. and uh, and a sort of communal focus on gathering food, and there being an element of meat and a larger element of sort of vegetable type. Mm. Mm. Is that right? Absolutely. And then of course. Jilba into Cumberung is the berry and fruit season. You know, that's early spring, late spring. Yeah. And, you know, that's when you could go in, walk through the bush and gather berries and quandongs. Quandongs ripening September, October, so they're just yeah. starting to ripen now. Yeah. Quandong is an eastern states word. And locally we would say Dumbari or Wongup or Wongil or Wolgol but everybody calls them quandongs. And they were the most important fruiting tree in the southwest. Right. If you think about it, we don't have many fruiting trees in the southwest. No. But we had lots of berry bushes. Right. Uh, but they were mostly little berries. They were snack foods. You, you know, and the kids would walk through the bush and fill up their little containers with the berries and munch away. Hmm. Hmm. So... Um, how did bush food become such a passion for yourself? I mean, you're later this week, you're working with the guys from Fervor. Yes. Um, Paul's going to be on the podcast in a few weeks' time. And you're doing the slow food event. 
So yes. you're obviously very, and as I said, in, in, and you're going to Italy as well soon. Yes. Um, and have been. Um, so obviously this is a big passion for you. How, how did that come about? Well... <clears throat> So she like, had the background in retail and marketing. And yes, then... I, I, you know, I got into the retail marketing quite by accident when I moved to England. You know, um, after a couple of years of travelling around, I needed to sort of make a decision, stay or go, and I made the decision to stay. And if I was going to stay, I needed a job, a proper job. Mm. So, um, you know, I went along to a recruitment agency and they placed me in a, in a buying office for a big department store group. And that was it. I mm. became a buyer, merchandiser, retailer. And, you know, I, it suited me. I mean, because I, I like people and I'm creative and I like, you know, new things and different things. And whilst I was there, I continued my interest in food and I went, I found a cooking school, the Prunleith School of Cookery. Ah. So I went to cooking school as well, so I honed up my... her kids. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, um, yeah, sort of learned some more skills and I just kept adding to my general food knowledge. And when I came back to Australia, I mean, it was obviously time to look at what was here but that got delayed a little bit because I went to work for another big department store group here but eventually I ran into the late Ken Colbung rest in peace again and you know he said you have to open a business in culture and the rest is history yes so we did my brother and I and um, my first bush food on the shelf was Kwandong Jam and it looked very lonely. So I started looking around for other things to put on the shelf with it, and there wasn't much available. Right. So I had to go hunting and gathering bush food, and the more I looked, the more I realised that few Aboriginal people were actually involved in the bush food industry. It was very much an industry that started on the eastern seaboard yes. and was being driven by non-Aboriginal people. Mm. So, you know, I was probably... It's interesting in and of itself. Yes, well, they saw the opportunity and the Aboriginal people really were only there to gather from the bush, you know, do the wild harvest. Right. And all the plantation growing was being done by non-Aboriginal people. And, you know, wild harvest, because, you know, I've done a, pretty, a lot of wild harvest myself in the past, um, <clears throat> it's very much, it's, it's very hard work. And you have to know where the trees or bushes are going to be. You have to, you know, scout them beforehand. You know, something like Kwandongs, not, e not every tree will fruit every year. Mm. Um, you know, we have Kwandong moth as well. So you want to get clean fruit. You don't want to pick a, tr a tree that's and get home and your fruit's full of little Kwandong moth larvae or instars. So, you know, you have to have all that good local knowledge and you know you, you're traveling a long distance every day picking fruit because we we still follow the old ways we don't strip an area bare yes you still leave food for the next person and for yep. the animals who come behind you so that's the end of the food chain as it were or the beginning of the food chain and mm. where there's the least money paid yes so you know that sparked an interest in my head as well that you know, we need to take more control of this ourselves. Mm. And first I gathered knowledge and then I've started to um, move things in the industry. I'm on the ANFAB board, which is the National Board for Bush Foods. And when I first joined the board, I was the only Aboriginal person on that board. There's now three. Yep. And um, we just sent our reconciliation action plan off to Reconciliation Australia. So that's dictating how that organisation will interface with Aboriginal people and encourage more Aboriginal people into the industry mm. and make sure that the benefit sharing is fair. Yep. So, you know, there was how? that... How do you propose? V very briefly, not the whole, go through the whole oh, plan. Well, it's like how having, having um, organisations like Noongar Land Enterprises who yep. are 
using ILC or Indigenous Land Corporation purchased farms to start growing bush food crops. Right. Like York, like sandalwood. Yeah. Most people probably don't think of sandalwood as being a food crop, mm. but that produces a tree nut. Just as you can eat the kernel of the kwandong tree, that's another tree nut. Mind you, those kwandong kernels are much harder to crack. Mm. It's much easier to crack a sandalwood nut, and there are a lot yeah. more sandalwood trees in plantation and not a lot of kwandong trees. Mm. So um, last year I was responsible for organising some programmes called Grow the Growers in WA and in other parts of Australia with ANFAB that was all funded mm. by Farming Together. So, you know, it's just taking that information out there. Last year I also organised the Bush Food Conference in Margaret River and that was partly for the community and partly for industry and mm. I brought um, Kwandong and wattle seed growers from the eastern seaboard to right. WA to share their experiences with local people. So you just keep feeding it in to the in, you know to the yes. potential industry and then you hear about oh somebody's growing kwandongs here oh somebody's doing this here somebody wants to grow wattle seed it's and it of, starts to grow it gains i mean momentum. you can't force it you can all you can do is present it as an opportunity yes. um tell people where funding might be available to them encourage 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 we mm. grow native limes here in wa yeah um, that's not an aboriginal com company but you know the opportunity exists for aboriginal people to work with that particular company and, and grow limes and feed into their marketing uh, because they've worked hard over the years to establish yep. those markets mm. Yeah. Mm. so it's not just a case of planting a few trees no but we want a lot of trees planted by yes. the right people. Indeed. But you also got to create the market. The market exists. At the moment, we have more demand than supply. Right. You go and try and buy a bush tomato at the moment. Not available for love or money. Right. Really difficult. High demand. Yes. Low supply. Low supply. Yeah. Hmm. 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 So... Um, so, so the, the, the passion to get the, this message across came very much from spotting this sort of gap and, and it coming from um, not necessar necessarily Aboriginal sources, is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> and now, you know, I, I have a good network of suppliers and I've, um, I, I do make some of my own products and I'm, I'll mm. be making more from yeah. here on in as I've spent time finding the right people and finding the right suppliers and have establishing those relationships and having some certainty of supply as well. Yes. Um, there's no point going into a market and, and then finding you can't get your product on the yeah. shelf. There's no really, uh, yeah. intermittent supply. Yeah, intermittent supply. But, you know, um, we, we can't do everything ourselves, so we still deal with other companies, and I like to deal with very reputable companies who work with Aboriginal people and give back to community and... And it's a good solution. Mm, sounds it. So, what would the, what are the steps you see from where we are now to everyday West Australian households um, starting to encompass more native bush foods in their um, staples? Well, you know, we have a few things that a lot of people now know about. You know, lemon myrtle would have to be the ubiquitous herb yes. of choice. You can grow a lemon myrtle tree in your garden here, or you can go to various gourmet shops and buy lemon myrtle. You can come and see me in the Swan Valley and I'll sell you some lemon myrtle yes. as well, <laughs> along with other things. And, um, you know, it's such a useful herb because you can use it in both sweet and savoury applications. There's no sweetness in the leaf itself. so. Yes. You can make a lemon myrtle cheesecake or you can do lemon myrtle chicken kebabs yep. and lots of other things in between. Wattle seed, most people have heard of wattle seed and, you know, they like to make Anzac biscuits with wattle seed. But 
you know, there's unroasted wattle seed and roasted wattle seed. And the roasted wattle seed is what you would use mostly in sweet cooking. Mm. Because when you roast wattle seed, it takes on lovely coffee, mocha, hazelnut aromas. The mm. unroasted wattle seed is more creamy and nutty. And I like to add it to sauces and casseroles and stews and things because you yeah. get that lovely creamy, nutty flavor. But it will also thicken your um, stew or your casserole for you or your sauce. Yeah. Because it, it, as soon as you put it into any liquid, it starts absorbing that liquid. So if you're mm. cooking with wattle seed, you might need to add some more moisture. I always recommend, especially with the roasted wattle seed being added to biscuits and cakes and things, pour a little boiling water over it first just to start making it swell. Right. Release those flavours and aromas, soften it mm. up, and then add it. Hmm. Mm. What else is there out there that we can start to look right, at? Right, so a number of different herbs, um, and it always makes me laugh a bit because everything's got to be a native alternative to a European something. See, this is this is the thing you see. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, um, and and this is why I was asking the question about traditionally what would people be eating, because it's to me as I as I was thinking about and preparing for this podcast, it's either. To me, the, the route to market is either, as you've said, supplementing things that are already in this Western diet, or the bigger, the bigger game to me would be, how do you alter the Western diet towards? Because you know, it's one thing talking about, if you don't mind me saying, it's mm -hmm. one thing talking about herbs and stuff like that, and so yeah, we put a little herb in here, and that just you know, all tweaks the flavor and taste. But you're still eating casserole. You're still yeah. eating this, you're still eating that, which, you know, I'm getting the impression is a bit different to. Well, well, yes, so you, be, because we would point? we would put most of our cooking in the ashes. Mm. We would cook on an open fire. Yeah. We'd let the fire burn down and cook in the coals and the ashes, and you know we didn't have cooking vessels as such because we didn't have um, pottery um, or glass or metalware in the same way as has been developed in mm. European societies because um, it obviously wasn't a priority for our people. Mm. So you would be cooking your meat sometime or fish wrapped in paper bark um, or maybe in the leaves of the zamia cycad. The fruit's toxic, but um, old people told me that they used to lay the food in it. So the leaves are obviously not toxic. And I have also read that you can make a kind of um, starchy food. Uh, what do they call it? A um, not a sago. The word's not coming to me. But a starchy food from the sap of the leaves. Right. Um, so um, we would wrap things and cook them like that, and you know you just put things directly into the hot ashes. So like a a carder or racehorse goanna, you would put that one in in his skin, you'd gut him first. Mm. But other lizards like a little yawn or a little bobtail goanna, you don't gut him first, you cook him straight and um, straight away and gut him afterwards. Yes. So they've already been cooked in with the protection of their skin. Yes. And then you can open them up and eat the meat. Yes. Um, things like kangaroo, we might pound something like bloodroot, the boron. Uh, into a paste and use that as a seasoning or flavoring. Mm. So we didn't necessarily make things like stews and casseroles. Mm. We ate the meat, we ate the vegetables, we ate the fruits. They tended to be more separate dishes. Right. Yeah. But you might put leaves or herbs in with them as they were cooking. Yes. To give them more flavor and to season them. Right. I guess I guess then Yes. How can we take, I guess that was then, if we look at now. Look how, at now. How do we go from just providing a few herbs which help tweak a dish to reshaping dishes? Well, you know, you look at kangaroo meat. It's one of the healthiest meats you can get. Mm -hmm. It is very low in fat and very low in cholesterol. It's high in protein and high in iron and you can cook it very simply mm. so for us we would cook it in the ashes 
um, we would relish would this be the, a, a freshly killed yes um, kangaroo yeah 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 yep. and so you're just eating that meat as I say you might pound up some blood root or put some other leaves in with it to provide some flavoring our diets weren't rich in salt and pepper those sort of seasonings didn't exist yep. so you know you always have to adapt and adjust for the the local yeah. palate but you can just cook simple food you know just yeah. cook yourself a kangaroo fillet put a tail in the oven or make you know you don't have to make kangaroo stew tail stew or kangaroo tail soup Mm. or kangaroo tail brawn wrap it up in some alfoil and stick it in the oven and just let it cook until the meat's coming off the bone and imagine that you've put that tail in the fire in the ashes fur on right and then strip off the fur or strip off the alfoil and enjoy the meat that's in there and mm. the tail is the best bit to eat is it it's the softest sweetest meat I'm salivating just thinking about eating kangaroo you are. tail. I am. <laughs> I haven't eaten a tail for a while, so I need to get some kangaroo tail. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, cool, this this sounds great. Um, my 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 ingredient and my recipe horizons and are, are expanding. Short of coming and catching you this weekend at Entwined, where can they go to get some ideas and inspiration? Well, you know, there are some bush tucker trips and excursions that you can make mm -hmm. around the state. Um, so if you're a big traveller, you can go onto a website called WAITOC, W-A-I-T-O-C, which stands for the Western Australian Tourism Operators, um, Western Australian Indigenous Tourism Operators Council. Mm -hmm. And we produce a touring map every year and it will show you every Aboriginal tourism business that you can go and visit and it'll show you the ones where you can have a bush food experience ah. and if you want to stay close to home come and visit me at Malinup Aboriginal Gallery I've mm. got tastings out on the table every day oh, wow. and you can book and take part in a bush tucker talk and tastings activity with me too all right so plenty of opportunity to get Educated. Absolutely. Hmm. And taste. What, um, what has been some of your sort of key learnings as you've sort of um, identified your passion to get the bush food um, message across to where we are today? What have been some of the key learnings as you've gone across that journey? Oh, well, you know, it's always very good to have a depth of knowledge. You know, mm. when I've gone out and found out about food, I don't trust a single source. I go and check it from several sources. Right. Because not all food that looks the same is edible. So not all wattle seed, for example, is edible. Right, yeah. Don't just run down to the bottom of the garden and start eating wattle seeds. Some are highly toxic. Yes. But there's plenty of edible wattles. Around the world, right. there's probably about 1,100 acacia species. About 1,000 of them exist here in Australia. But only about 100 produce an edible seed. Right. And even amongst the edible seeds, some of them have anti-nutrient factors. And so you have to treat them, like roast them, before you eat them. Right. Otherwise, it can make you ill. Um, it's not so much that they make you ill, but they're not going to be doing you any good because they've got anti-nutrient factors. Oh, yes. They can be robbing nutrients from your body. Right. Uh, the example, the best known example there is Burke and Wills and the Nardu. They didn't know how to treat it, and so they were eating this Nardu seed, and it was robbing vitamin B5 from their body. Right. Yeah. Hmm. They didn't treat it correctly. And some of the food which is toxic and can be eaten was things like the zamia cycad nuts, which we call buyu. Mm. And famous example of somebody not knowing what to do is William de Vlaming when he came ashore in 1697. And they came to Freshwater Bay. It's called Freshwater Bay for a reason because there are streams letting out into the river where they yes. could fill their water barrels and they went searching for food and they found camps 
that had been deserted by Aboriginal people because we were very good at melting away into the bush. Mm -hmm. And they saw that we had been collecting the buyu, so they assumed that they would be okay to eat, so they ate them. And they wrote in their diaries that there was nothing to choose between them and death because the toxin in the buyu is a powerful emetic that makes you vomit and vomit and vomit. Right. So they had a very bad experience. And you get round that by crushing up the nuts and putting them into dilly bags and leaching out the toxins in mm. running water. So that's what we did. And then we made them into little bread cakes and baked them in the ashes. Mm. That's so good local knowledge, good local guides who can tell you precisely what's good to eat and, and what to avoid. <laughs> to fault, yeah. Yes, and, you know, bush tomatoes, another one, plenty of edible bush tomatoes, plenty that are not edible. So, again, you know, you want to be eating the right ones, so you always want to be with a good local guide. Mm. Um, and I always say to people, get them to eat one first. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, have there been any other learning points through that? Oh, just how much there is out there. And yeah. It doesn't matter how much I know. I know that there's still 10 times more information and knowledge for me to acquire. Mm. So I never get sick of talking to people. I never get sick of finding references and books and things and reading up. And sometimes it'll just be a tiny little reference somewhere and you think, aha, aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And then you'll run away and follow that little lead and, and start, you know, a new little journey into bush food. Yes. So, and also because common names are repeated. Mm. So everybody's got a black wattle, everybody's got a coastal wattle, everybody's got this wattle and that wattle, but they're all different species. So it's always good to know the botanical name of the plants you're dealing with. So I always, you know, would, you know, say, if I'm saying lemon myrtle, I'll say Backhousia citriodora. Yeah. If I'm talking about an edible wattle seed, I might say, well, the most common one you'll buy in the shop is Acacia victoriae. But local wattle seeds here that we can eat would include Cyclops, Microbotria, Cuminata, and Saligna. But roast that one first. But roast that one first. Hmm. Yeah, no. It, I think as we had a very brief discussion beforehand, um, just so easy to just be here in Western Australia and be caught up in Perth and the, and the, the urban area and by the standard fare that we expect from Coles and Woolworths and mm. what have you, but to, there's a whole big state out there that can produce all sorts of Oh stuff. yes. Wait a wonderful, uh, uh, nutritious this, and exciting and tasty. And, and I think it's going to become more and more important for our own health and nutrition mm. to learn about bush foods and to grow things where they need to be grown. You know, as we do all this monoculture and grow the same crops, even with leaving um, soils fallow for a while, it's not the right way to grow. And you will find that people are looking for better nutrition in their food so the food that we're eating now farmed in the way that we farm it now has an amazing percentage that i can't remember off the top of my head less nutrients yes than 30 40 50 years ago mm. so your tomatoes aren't as good for you as they once were unless maybe you grow them yourself in your backyard and the difference between the taste of a homegrown tomato and a shop-bought tomato is amazing. Mm. That should give you a hint or a clue right there. Yes. And things are grown for shelf life, for appearance, and they're put in cold store. We just need to get back to being a bit closer to where our food is produced and how it's produced mm. and eating it closer to the time of harvest as well. Yeah, I, a theme that has come up in the podcast before is taking responsibility for the food that you put in your mouth. 
and thank yeah. you. Yeah, but also taking responsibility for the land. Um, my late partner always said, if you live here, you're now responsible for caring for this land. Mm. And we say, if you care for country, country will care for you. And that's very true. Mm. You know, look what's happened in the southwest with the wheat belt. How much land is now given over to salinity. Because as we pulled out those deep-rooted crops, trees, and replaced them with shallow-rooted crops, then up came the water table and the, and the salts because this is such an ancient land. You know, all those mountains have already crumbled away and all the salt's gone into the earth. And we're now, you know, reaping the whirlwind mm. with that salinity. And we once had a grain belt around Australia which was greater than the wheat belt that exists now. And there was no problem with salinity then because Aboriginal people were great land managers. Mm. And we harvested the kangaroo grass, we harvested native millet, we harvested the native rices, the native weeping ripe grass. We harvested so many different roots and tubers. In the southwest, we have about 150 different tuberous plants that can give us food all year round. Yes. You know, when I talked about the yulk before, yulk has got a couple of cousins, one we call Kana and the other one we call Connor. And they're Maxwellii and Cirrhosa of the Platysac genus. When we harvest the yulk, there's lots and lots of tubers on that yulk plant. We'll just harvest one half. Yes. We'll just take the tubers from one side and then we'll fill in that hole and leave that plant in situ to regrow the tubers on that mm. side. And sometime in the future, we'll come and harvest the other side and then let that side regrow. So this kind of working in harmony with the land meant that we didn't destroy plants, we didn't destroy the land, we always had plenty of food. And the experience on the eastern seaboard was the same with the... Um, the um, oops, lost a word in my head. The little daisy yams that they had, which will come to me in a minute. Yeah. Go and read Bruce Pascoe's book. He talks about it in that one. But, you know, there the women would take out the plant and there'd be three tubers there, grandmother, mother and daughter. They'd harvest the mother one in the middle and replant the plant, the Murnong daisy, that's what it is, oh, Murnong. Yeah. And then that plant would grow another tuber. So the way we harvested and planted was so different. And it, the cycle continued mm. and the land was productive and the food was full of nutrition. Could you see, uh, could you see those practices yielding industrial size crops? Well, probably not. Yes. I mean, and this is... Given where we are now. We, we uh, yes, probably not going to yield an industrial size crop. Um, but Given that we've gone away from what you're yes. describing. You know, We're doing those two point, huge... 2.3 million people here in Western Australia. Yeah, yeah, and everybody wants to be fed. Mm. But, you know, we have to take a different approach for farming. Otherwise, mm. you know, there won't be any land to grow anything for anybody on. Yes, because we destroy it with our current farming methods. Mm. We need to look at different farming methods. And there is a new movement called regenerative farming. And, um, you know, that's, these things are starting to gain traction. You know, permaculture is old now, but permaculture is still popular. And it's another way of growing food in smaller patches, but you're growing more food and nutrient-rich food. Yes. Superb. Dad, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. I, I feel like I've had an encyclopedic download in from my head. <laughs> well, we're just scratching the surface. I know, and, that, and that's what I feel. I yeah. feel. I feel like I've just ventured slightly outside of Perth and not incorporated the whole state. But, um, yeah, it's been absolute pleasure. So if, if anybody wants to come and find you, where can they find you? 
They can find me at Malinup Aboriginal Gallery on West Swan Road in the Swan Valley. Mm. And this weekend at Entwined in the Valley, yep. you can find me either at our pop-up event with Fervor yep. and at the Slow Food event. Indeed. And in both cases, I'll be cooking bush food and talking about bush food. Excellent. Dale, thank you very much. I hope you come back again because I feel like there's even more for us to oh, talk thanks, about. Thanks, Bryn. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay.